Welcome to the Retail Tech Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Chris Opdam, CEO of a company called Betty Blocks. Uh, Chris is talking uh, with me from Netherlands. Betty Blocks and Chris have been changing the world with the concept of no code, which is very interesting, and I wanted to learn more about it. So, um, hi, Chris. Thank you so much for joining me. Yes, thank you for having me. Uh... Happy so, to be here. In your own words, if you can describe uh, what is Betty Blocks and the concept of no code or low code. Yeah, sure. Um, Betty Blocks is an application development platform uh, where we enable uh, a new breed of uh, application developers to build applications in the cloud without the need to learn a uh, programming language. And uh, that's, of course, the reason why we're called no code. What we're trying to do is um, to change the typical profile of a developer. It's becoming more and more important for each type of company, and every uh, company is becoming more and more an IT company as well. Um, so what we try to do is democratize uh, software development by uh, removing the need to learn a programming language. Um, and what we do is we offer software development by visual modeling. So you can drag and drop a UI, you can drag and drop a flow behind that UI, and integrate with other systems in a no-code manner as well. Um, you mentioned the no and slash low-code space. Um, and, and this is what Gartner calls the high productivity space as well, the HPA pass uh, world, and that is split into no and low-code. Um, there are a lot of innovations happening right now. Um, with low-code, um, you are still able to do development. With the up and down side, it's, uh, that uh, that brings with it. So you're still able to do coding, and with no code, there's no need to learn a programming language, programming language at all anymore. Okay, so so is that basically like a um, a platform differentiation between low code and no code? I mean, is is it? Uh, to me, it sounds very similar and very close to each other as a as a like a, let's say as a as a business person. But is, is there really like yeah. that big of a difference technically between the two? Um, well, um, of course, we are the same type of platforms. Um, but the difference is is who is using the platform. What you see with low code platforms is um, they are typically used by experienced developers. So let's say you are a .NET developer, you use a low-code .NET development platform, and with that, you speed up your own development. And with no code, you change the type of person that is doing development from a more business, from a technical person to a more business-oriented person. But then again, we are still both uh, application development platforms, so we are very much similar, but there are some uh, um, some, uh, some big differences on the other end, on our end as well. Okay, and I think what uh, you also refer to the the no code user as a citizen user, right, or, or a citizen developer is that the, the term that's being used? Yeah, that's what yeah. you see um, more and more. Um, what uh, Gardner calls is uh, uh, is um, shadow IT that is most of the time created by people who are in the business side of an organization. Um, they have a need for a specific type of software. And everybody knows that IT departments are often very busy. Uh, they don't have the time or budget to create uh, smaller applications, but the business side still has the need for that application. So um, what often happens is that they develop applications themselves or they look for, the, um, uh, for uh, software uh, outside the view of the IT department and with that creating shadow IT. But if you um, enable that same person with a no-code platform, um, um, under the control of an IT department, um, we call uh, the same person a citizen developer. So that is a business-oriented uh, um, developer who is able to build applications um, in uh, under the control of the IT department. Um, and that's a new breed of developers. And uh, uh, it's a, a topic that has been uh, um, on a lot of um, uh, IT managers and CIOs' minds. And um, we are, um, that's a, a topic that uh, we are addressing as well. Okay. So, I mean, if, if it is really possible to create a working application by just dragging and dropping things, is that even like, can, is, it, is it even development work? 
Um, yeah, we, we still call it development work uh, because um, although the difficult technical parts have been removed out of the creation of an application, you still need to um, develop and design a good application. And as it's more um, uh, popular to say, if you give the fool a tool, um, it's still a fool. Um, <laughs> and same goes with, with no code or local platforms as well. Um, so you need to have uh, familiarity with application development, or at least need to know how a proper application should look like. Um, so uh, it is a misconception that um, it is targeted at, let's say, consumer uh, at the consumer end that, pe that everybody um, who knows how to control a computer is able to build an application. Uh, but it's more for that citizen developer who is familiar with creating applications based on Microsoft Access or who is that business person inside a marketing department who knows how to build a, a website using WordPress. Um, and there are a lot of people inside organizations who have a very um, um, a technical or very technical savvy um, and they are able to develop a, an application with a no-code platform. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, so, so it sounds like almost like product managers would be a good user for this technology. Does that... Yeah, right? and, and what we see happening is that um, uh, the organization set up multidisciplinary teams um, uh, who are using a no-code platform like Betty Blocks. Um, so there uh, could be somebody who is more uh, the interaction designer, somebody who is just a citizen developer who is, is the business-oriented guy. Um, and on the other hand, you can have the more a product manager, uh, but also a business analyst or uh, architects on the IT side. Um, and same goes with front-end developers as well. If you look at a more technical purpose of the application platform, um, uh, front-end developers are very familiar using front-end frameworks, but they always need a back-end developer to create an application. Right. And with platforms like ours, uh, no platform like Betty Blocks, that same front-end developer is able to do uh, to build complex application um, himself without the need for back-end uh, developers as well. So it's from one end citizen development, and on the other end it's experienced developers as well. So we try to facilitate both. Okay. Now uh, a little bit background on Betty Blocks. When when did the company start, and w what did what led you to actually think about this? concept and actually get this company started and you know how did it get to this point yeah so uh i started uh, my first company straight out of school together with my brother tim um and when that company grew um i was the developer and my uh, brother was a more business uh, or a business type of person and he was trying to um create um, um our internal um uh, software systems our administrative systems and stuff like that. But he ne always needed me as a developer to help him develop uh, that application. But he knew how the business processes worked and he wanted to do that himself. So uh, during that phase, we uh, created the first versions of Betty Blocks um, because we wanted to give Tim, my brother, a, a tool where he will be able to uh, automate and, uh, and, and, and create more um, uh, automated processes uh, based on uh, a no code or a, 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 an automation flow without the need to learn that the program language because he wasn't a developer. Like self service. And, and out of that, and out of that, uh, Betty Blocks uh, arise. You know, when, when when developers build applications that only do one thing, I call them single use case applications. The acronyms are SUC, like applications that suck. <laughs> only they do only <laughs> one thing. So. Uh, this is uh, and this is basically where you make the application so flexible that it can be used in multiple different ver uh, areas or uh, ways. So, do you how how does the architecture actually work? Is it like something like microservices where you can get really gra granular um, like functionality and merge them together? How can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, of course. Uh, we have uh, three basic concepts in our platform. Um, one of them is, of course, the UI, where you can visually create a UI by dragging and dropping, either that doing that for a mobile environment, so uh, a native uh, look and feel application on mobile, iOS, or Android. And on the other end, you can create web-based portals 
in all different uh, shapes and sizes. Um, on the other end, um, we have what we call data models, where you can store uh, application data in. And the third one is what we call actions. So if you click on a button in your UI somewhere, you want a flow to start um, or an action to start, and you can visually model that as well. So that is if you create one simple application. But if you create a bigger application, um, you can split that application into different services. Uh, it's not the same setup as with microservices because we are a, a no-code platform. But when you look at it, an architectural point of view, it's still the same type of setup. Um, you can split uh, uh, several applications, one into one application to several applications, and make sure that one uh, application is, uh, is has a special purpose to it. Uh, but most of our applications don't have that setup. Um, they are meant to create application in a very rapid way and in a very flexible way. Um, mostly people think that it's all about creating that first application fast, but what actually is the case is to change the entire organization or company into a, a, a more agile oriented uh, a company to make sure that you can not only create the first application fast, but to modify it fast as well. Because what is often uh, misunderstood is that application development is about creating that first version, but the actual success of an application inside an organization is probably the fourth or fifth version of an application uh, and that's where we um, um where we optimize that platform uh, as well okay. so you can have uh, and use for different setups from my experience the bigger challenge in creating a robust application really not even the technology it's the organizational structure that's like one of the major things even in microservices the organization is the first thing that needs to change so it sounds like you're working with the same concept yeah that's that's totally in line with um with our proposition as well so um we have split our uh, our company into a couple of propositions where people can uh, align our platform with. And one of them is what we call our innovation street. A lot of companies lack innovative power. And what we try to do with Betty Blocks is help them become more innovative um, by uh, offering them a way of work and a playbook where you can implement a more innovative structure inside your organization. So that is not about technology, not about software development from a technical point of view, but more organizing your company and finding a way to develop that innovation, innovative piece of software. And just like you mentioned, that's more an organizational thing uh, other than a, a software development thing. But of course, our platform is optimized to facilitate the process like that. The line of thinking of software developers and how software has actually positioned itself inside the organizations, I think really needs to change fundamentally. When I talk to a, a an engineering team and I say this tool really needs to be self-service so the marketing person can do whatever they want themselves and when I hear the question as to why that's like a red flag for me like you know a developer should not be asking why their tool should be self-service their question should be how do I make it self-service without even thinking that it is you know there is any other option I totally agree with what you're saying and, and I recognize that a lot as well. It's the same with um, um, how software developers and software de development are approached. Um, it has been too much and too often been all about the technology part, where at the end it's about solving a problem or making sure your organization works better in a specific way. And that's why we are a no-code platform on purpose, uh, because we want to remove the technology out of IT and make sure that it's all about creating success, creating innovative products and being disruptive, of course, and that not necessarily needs to be all about coding and technology that much. How do you actually measure the ROI? A client actually wants to start using a platform such as uh, you know, Betty Blocks. How do you measure that? Do you say that your developers or this group of developers, they take a week to do something and with Betty Blocks, it's going to take him a day to do it? Or how does that work? Yeah, that's one of the ways to approach that. We have done quite a lot of comparisons uh, to uh, traditional development, as we call it. So uh, we had one comparison to, uh, uh, to Java development, a modern day Java development, uh, where we uh, build an application in Betty Blocks and we had another team building an application in Java. And we were uh, uh, eight times faster than that Java team. Um, so that's a very easy way to create an ROI, of course, because it, you save yourself a lot of uh, a lot of time, and with that budget as well. Uh, but another way to create uh, to uh, calculate the ROI 
is also about um, uh, time to market as well. Um, so it's not only about reducing costs, but also being earlier to the market than others and being more flexible as well. So when you look at uh, new products that are being released, um, if you're able to push out a new version, let's say every two weeks, um, uh, the ROI is, of course, in, in, in more usage at your platform, more usage at your product, uh, at the end product built with Betty Locks. And for us, that's a more important ROI than um, um, uh, than the actual, let's say, cost saving that we are, that we're able to do. As you work with different companies all over the world, uh, are you finding that this works better for certain industries than others? Um, yeah, I, I think there are uh, there are uh, character characteristics uh, that you can see um, within uh, uh, sectors uh, where uh, no code platforms work better. Um, when you look at um, let's say bigger companies, the larger corporates, they are finding it harder, of course, to innovate. Um, when you have a small and already very flexible organization, um, they most of the time have small development teams which are very uh, well organized. They have a lesser fit at our end sometimes. We have a, a great fit with organizations who have a bigger step to take when looking at innovation and looking at software development. Um, so when you look at the different sectors out there, I guess um, uh, there are some differences to it as well, uh, but not necessarily at sector level, but more the type of sector it is, I guess. So the larger corporations, uh, organizations have a bigger pain. That's why it, you know, uh, that's that correct. something like this, uh, no code, actually relieves that pain much more measurably, smaller corporation, which is more agile. Probably a difference between waterfall and agile development, is that also a factor in how successful they are in using no code? Yeah, um, uh, it's very important to not only adapt a, a no code platform like Betty Blocks, but also to make sure you have a, a modern day approach to software development as well. And we help our, our clients and organizations with that as well. Uh, because it's not only about the tooling. Like you said, there is a huge difference with organizations who approach software development more waterfall or uh, more agile. And at the end, when you look at time to market, uh, agile work ways are, are far more efficient in, do, in doing stuff like that. As you talk about how the no-code software or platform work, I'm thinking, what is the future? You know, right now, AI is really becoming a lot more evolved, even voice. Do you see a time maybe in like 10 years where you even you talk to Alexa or Google Home or whatever in the office and you know you just say build me this feature we are doing a, quite some research on implementing AI in the uh, in the in the software development part but I think there's a popular way again to put uh, our expectations in that uh, area as well uh, I think it goes something like that we overestimate the changes that will happen to the world in year 10 and we underestimate this the smaller but more significant changes that we will undergo in the next three years or so and i think that applies to software development as well so actually telling alexa to build a software application is probably not going to happen in that way uh, but we are using um, ai and starting to use ai more and more uh, in smaller portions of that software um, so of course pattern recognitions and other AI stuff is very important. So when testing software, AI could be very important. And we are working on that as well and on other parts as well. So I think it will be far more easier to implement stuff like uh, voice and AI. We have a, a great set of uh, fe uh, features and services like that offered in our blog store, which is our application store. It means that you can just simply uh, um, select the voice block and you'll be able to use Amazon Alexa or other services within, without the need for coding. There are very big steps to take in that area before we have automatic, automated software development. Uh, but for some smaller pieces, that could, be, it could definitely be the case. If that actually creates great UIs as well, uh, that's probably too big of a step to take. I'm very curious which uh, significant changes we will undergo in the next three years because I guess those, those are sometimes a little bit harder to uh, predict. Can you talk about an example or a case study of uh, one client that you worked with and how this the whole implementation and the usage went? One of our clients is a pan-European insurance company where they were struggling with, with their propositions. Um, they had a big uh, software development team 
and they had an innovation uh, a manager as well. They uh, outsourced all their software development to uh, to India. And what happened is that the, their product team, um, who was based in Europe, thinking and designing a lot of new uh, new products. They had great proof of concepts, wireframes, and everything. And then uh, the actual development started. And then it was a tr very traditional software development product again, with all the common problems uh, that they had as well. So uh, then um, we appeared on the stage and what we changed in that is to create a real DevOps team and a real uh, multidisciplinary team as well, together with our client, um, where they um, had a product manager, interaction designers, a lot of people from the business side as well, who actually designed and set the, the blueprints for the actual application. But there was an experienced IT guy in there as well. And so um, what they sh did is shifted the actual development part out of outsourcing and then uh, introduced citizen development ship. And you would expect that to slow down the actual development because, because of course, you, you know, with outsourcing, you have a lot of developers on your hands uh, who are most of the time pretty cheap as well. Um, and you would think that that would really speed up development. But what actually happened is that what we found out, the actual coding um, was really slowing the innovation down. And, and the actual coding wasn't the hardest part of creating that application. It was uh, about creating a great, UI, a great UI and making sure you test that with your test audience as well. Um, so the first version in the previous um, setup was more a paper UI um, a wireframe concept. So they just tested it out. But with Betty Blocks, they actually created the first version, which was a proof of concept, but it was a very clickable and usable demo as well. So within uh, two to four weeks, they had an application built by non-developers, but they were actually able to use it with actual end users as well. So they could really test the product and that really speed up development and that product is still in use. And they are, have transferred to the IT departments and still a lot of um, business people are involved. But that showed us a very natural flow from creating a first version, but not throwing away the the first version, but making sure you iterate through uh, that phase and make sure that you create version after version. Um, so that was an excellent case for us, proved to us that citizen development is something that could actually work uh, as long as you make sure that your own IT department is, is involved as well. So we're very happy with that result. And um, we copied that through uh, the last couple of years to a lot of other industries as well. So not only finance and fintech, uh, but uh, more in property management and healthcare as well in the government sector. Um, and you, we noticed that the same setup applies to almost every organization. So, um, and that's, that's our typical no-code approach. That's a great example. What was the organizational work involved in actually getting this completed? You know, we talked about the organization actually needing to change. Was that a part of what you did with this client? Of course, the actual changing was, was all done by the organization itself. Um, we more or less inspired them to, uh, to change that. And what we noticed is that they really needed to have a mindset change. So the IT department need to radically uh, change the approach of, of software development and innovation. Uh, it's not a project, it's a, a continuous process. Uh, you need to make sure that you work together in a very close and tight manner with a lot of people who have different disciplines as well. Um, so that was uh, one of, on, the, on one end, was a very uh, important mindset change. They changed, that changed the IT department from an organization that normally says, no, we can't, and yes, we can, which is uh, a very common problem inside IT departments. They have too less budget, not enough resources, um, so they can't really say yes that much. But if you change that approach, you become more a facilitating IT department, and you can actually help uh, the business as well. Uh, and the business needed to change the approach as well to make sure that they understood that they should be involved all the time and not only just dropping an ID somewhere, but making sure you help and check and validate your own ID as well through design thinking. Um, so uh, a, a lot of stuff um, gradually changes uh, inside an organization in a process like that. Okay. So I'm, I'm in, interested to, I guess, dig in a little bit deeper, if you don't mind, because it's not easy for the IT department just to change the mindset like that. Who in the organization really drove this change? Who was able, the CTO, the CIO, who do you think was the most effective person or office to be able to actually drive this change? And 
stay on top of it, right? Because you probably have to have multiple restarts in large organizations. It just is not gonna happen in one swoop. Yeah, so in this situation, there was an innovation manager who actually uh, started and initiated the change. Very talented and high energy IT manager as well, who understood that he needed to change. And uh, when you look at uh, a lot of research done, if you look at uh, Gartner's bimodal IT, yeah, you see that a lot of IT managers and CIOs are familiar with the fact um, um, of bimodal IT, but also the way to change an IT department and transform it into, a, let's say, a yes saying organization. So they knew they needed to change, but they didn't really know how to do that. And, and that's where we helped. Uh, and that's why when you put the different departments together in a positive vibe uh, under the vision of that I, I, uh, innovation manager, uh, that, that was, I guess, the actual energy that drove the, uh, this project and that result uh, and changed the organization with that as well. So in this case, the, the innovation manager was your champion. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, together with an ambassador uh, from the, uh, the, uh, the business side as well. We had um, a manager who, who was in charge of a specific business unit who understood that he needed to be a little bit more patient and try to understand what the actual pain was that the reason was why initially they weren't really that eager in changing that much. What you really need is a positive vibe on, on all ends as well, uh, but that really helped as well. So th those two people were, uh, in my eyes, both uh, very much champions. As far as how evolved is the concept of no code, where would you put it from like uh, from zero to 10? How, how close are you or is the industry from getting to where you think it can get? There are two ways to approach that question. And one is uh, where I think we are at right now and where, let's say, the bigger audience think uh, no code and low code is, and especially no code. People expect us to be, let's say, in a scale of 10 to be at two or three right now. Uh, but in that same scale, we are actually are at, a, at an eight or a nine already. Um, people expect no code to be uh, used in, for very simple applications, uh, but we are already at a stage where you can build very much complex applications with a no code platform like Betty Blocks. People are very much surprised that they are able to do that. So th those are, of course, two ways to approach it. But if you would ask me where we're currently at, I would say a three or a four right now. And that's more because I know uh, what's still uh, ahead uh, of us as well. So there is so much more to do besides just dragging and dropping flows and actions and uh, and, and UIs as well. We are building on a, on a big and bigger and bigger library of default features, but also default and standardized applications. So what you're looking at is not only um, speeding up development ground up, but using and reusing uh, parts of applications and combining and compiling those together. And that's probably where the, the next step of no coding will actually, uh, uh, where it will be. Uh, because if you, if you build something from scratch very fast, that's of course very interesting. But if you don't need to develop half of your application anymore because you can reuse it from other applications or from a library, that's where it becomes even more powerful. Uh, and that's where we're working on right now and uh, to uh, uh, to expand that library and making sure that people don't really need to build stuff anymore. And that's where one of the big differentiators is between low and no code. If you combine code, because low code still contains a lot of code, it's very difficult to combine that. And there's a lot of manual labor that you need. But if you go to no code, it is as simple as you expect it to be. You just have one block here and one block there, and you can automatically combine that without thinking about how to combine that. And that's where the actual next step is going to be. And uh, I know a lot of people will be very happy with that. And that's why I think it's, it's something around a four right now. But even then, uh, when looking at AI and other stuff, there's so much great stuff um, uh, on the road ahead that uh, I'm very enthusiastic and, and positive about, uh, let's say, the next 10 years of no coding. It's not a short term trip for sure. <laughs> this is like a really off and probably or wild question. Do you think blockchain has a place in actual software development in the functionality of software development. of course building blockchain is software but can it can it become like you know you talked about libraries 
right? Can can libraries actually be managed over blockchain? I'm not sure if they need to be. The power of blockchain is, of course, the, a decentralized uh, ledger somewhere. If you want to implement blo blockchain in a good way, you need to have the need to do stuff like that. And um, I'm not sure if, if, uh, if there is in software development. Of course, blockchain... Uh, when looking at it from a technical point of view, it's just a way to store stuff uh, and a very innovative and, 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 and a very awesome way as well. Um, so it's just one of the blocks or one of the components that we use inside software development, same as with AI, uh, same as with voice stuff as well. So it's one of the services that we use. If you look at Ethereum to manage contracts as well, uh, that could be a little bit more interesting as well. Um, than just blockchain. But then again, it's just part of a, a great tool set and a great library of things that we can use. But there are a lot of uh, uh, other stuff. Is, uh, there's, there's a lot of other great stuff as well out there. Be kind of interesting is if that would be also a library, just like you said, smart contract management, product manager or somebody can build into the app, dragging and dropping it. Yeah, and, and we are actually doing research on that as well. We, are, we have done some uh, proof of concept for clients of us. Uh, to use Betty Blocks in uh, cooperation with uh, blockchain technology. Um, and everything we build uh, is uh, in tests like that will be automatically uh, freely available in our uh, block store as well. Um, and that's what I just stated as well, is right. that that's the, the, probably the most underestimated um, um, power user, uh, usage of an, uh, no code platforms is that you have a big library of pre built stuff that you're very easy to use. and one of those items can be uh, a contract. Uh, you already have half of the concept in the name anyway, Betty Blocks and Blockchain. Yeah, <laughs> that, that could be a great combination. What's what's on your plate, the big things on your plate right now? We just moved, so I'm happy to room, remove that uh, from my to-do list and add <laughs> it to, and remove that from my bucket list as well. So I'm um, uh, happy to focus on, on what we're good at, and that's in building a, a, a great company and great platform. So when looking at the the product and platform, um, the block store and the library that I just mentioned is a is a big piece of what we do and what we are continuously improving and developing. When you look at the vision of our product, um, our biggest theme is what we call developer happiness. So that citizen developer or experienced developer uh, should be uh, very happy and very uh, pleased with using Betty Blocks on a day to day basis. It's the tool you use eight hours a day or maybe longer. Um, so it's um, uh, the, the devil is in the detail for that. And that's why we uh, listen to our users uh, all the time and make sure we um, we don't add big features all the time, but make sure on a day-to-day -day basis we build our product and improve our product at a more detailed level to make all of our developers happy as well. When looking at our organization, um, we just opened up a second office in uh, in uh, on the East Coast in Atlanta as well. So that was a big step for us and uh, we are growing the team uh, over there. Um, we are looking to open up a new sales office in the APAC region as well. Uh, that's an important new region where we're focusing on in 2018. Um, and uh, then again, um, our uh, let's say our first region was uh, Western Europe and uh, we are, uh, um, are investing in that as well. Um, but um, then again, our company culture is, is is a way for us to uh, to differentiate. Um, um, we build a great office and uh, we have a, an excellent and, and, and very fun team to work with. Um, and we hope that it shows in the product and it shows on our uh, 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 on uh, social media and on our website as well. And that people uh, really embrace uh, the way we try to do stuff. So really uh, remove the IT, uh, the, uh, the technical uh, technology part out of IT and make sure that uh, software development becomes available for a broader audience and that a lot of people have fun doing that. So uh, fun is an important word for us. Yeah, and I mean, I can tell you, I saw a picture of one of your office or the, was it the old office with all the plants in it and I just loved it. That is so amazing and so unique. Um, uh, you go to some of the best, nicest design buildings, at least in the US that I know of and you know other parts of the you know world as well and they they pay the least amount of attention to what's inside the building and the environment that the you know with the, the right type of lighting and in like plants make a huge difference so i was so happy to see that you're really putting a focus on that 
and you know promoting it in the office yes yeah, it's, it's a it's a room um and uh, a, a part of our office that we call the jungle uh which is a very inspiring place to work um and uh, we think it's a very healthy uh, place to work as well so there's probably a lot of oxygen in the air um yeah um, and um yeah so uh, work should be uh uh, uh, fun, uh, but of course we like to work hard as well. With our new office, I think we have created a great vibe and a great place to work, um, and it helps us to grow our company as well. Teams that have fun are a lot more productive in whatever they do. I mean, it's not about working long hours. It's about really being passionate and having fun uh, doing it. So I think that's it. That's an awesome formula. Uh, one of the greatest features that we have added are probably built in, in, uh, in a couple of days. And the most uh, uh, simplest feature sometimes takes weeks to uh, develop, but it, it sometimes it just takes the touch of a genius or a small spark uh, to make sure that you create something in a very short period. And that's a lot of fun to do, and you need to create a, a great environment to do stuff like that. I'm really excited about Betty Blocks and look forward to seeing you moved all the way up to 10. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. Yeah, thank you so much for having me.